start out in 1954 by saying by 1968 you can't say nigger. that hurts your backfire so you say stuff like uh, forced busing states rights and all that stuff and you're getting so abstract now you're talking about cutting taxes and all of these things you're talking about are totally economic things and the byproduct of them is blacks get hurt worse than whites because obviously sitting around saying uh, we want to cut taxes, we want to cut this, and we want is much more abstract than, than even the busing thing. Uh, and a hell of a lot more abstract than that. I'm sure that you've heard parts of that quote from Lee Atwater before. Taken from an interview where the brilliant political strategist discussed how the Republican Party had to adopt its methods of appealing to white voters, perhaps the most striking aspect of the remark is the inherent premise that Republican appeals to white racial tensions would always occur and are standard procedure. Looking at the way that modern Republicans speak today, you would be able to make the argument that Atwater was astute in saying that racial appeals certainly have become the Republican norm. I am opposed to busing for the purpose of achieving racial balance in our schools. I have spoken out against busing scores of times over many years. And I believe most Americans, white and black, share that view. But what we need now is not just speaking out against more busing. We need action to stop it. Just imagine if the so-called peaceful demonstrators in the streets were in charge of every lever of power in the U.S. government. Just think of that. Who is trying to abolish immigration enforcement and establish speech codes designed to muzzle dissent? Always remember, they are coming after me because I am fighting for you. That's what's happening. Get any job that teaches you to show up on Monday. Get any job that teaches you to stay all day, even if you're having a fight with your girlfriend. I mean, the whole process of get, making work worthwhile is central. We have cut, and this is a huge, you, you put your finger on it. I take seriously that every American of every ethnic background in every neighborhood has the right to pursue happiness and that it was endowed by their creator. That means you're going to see from me extraordinarily radical proposals to fundamentally change the culture of poverty in America and to give people a chance to rise very rapidly. Regardless of the varying subtlety in those remarks, all of them can and should be viewed as appeals made to white conservatives with purposeful undertones of race. President Nixon's remarks about busing are made in the name of creating a quality of opportunity, but coincide with white fears at the time of black students taking seats in schools that had previously been filled with deliberately white student bodies. President Trump's remarks are made in the name of law and order, but coincide with his narrative that immigrants and black protesters are thugs and looters that his opposition wants to replace American culture with. Newt Gingrich himself would tell you that his remarks are made in the name of approving the work ethic of young Americans, but they themselves perpetuate the racial narrative that black Americans face disproportionate poverty and financial inequality because of a lack of merit and not because the lack of a systematic meritocracy. And so, the question of why these sorts of mass remarks have become so integral in the Republican Party's path to and control of the White House becomes one that's incredibly worth the time it takes to look into, and one that can be used to frame understanding of how the party that so proudly began with Abraham Lincoln became a party that relies on a conservative, minoritarian, and race-motivated rule. It's hard to pinpoint exactly where this transition began. After all, the original home of race-minded conservatives is the Democratic Party, and it's difficult to describe any of the Republican Party's early attempts to appeal to those race-minded Southerners as successful. Take a look at the Republican primary of 1964. George Romney, a moderate who campaigned largely on including civil rights as a primary issue in his campaign, lost decidedly to Barry Goldwater a highly conservative libertarian who put forth a plan to campaign on states' rights and opposition to civil rights to try and win the South. And win the South he did, along with his home state of Arizona and absolutely nothing else and a crushing loss to Lyndon Johnson. And yet this apparent failure of Goldwater's strategy to take back the South did not dissuade the conservative wing of the party from continuing to try. <laughs> 
The 1968 Republican Convention saw Richard Nixon win on the back of Republican Southerners and prominent hard conservatives like Strom Thurmond. And yet, although Nixon won the election, it was not because of these Republican Southerners. It was instead because of discord within the Democrats. The South mostly voted for the newly independent George Wallace, and younger Democrats pined after Eugene McCarthy and the late Bobby Kennedy instead of being motivated to vote for the newly nominated Hubert Humphrey. However, these Republican fortunes quickly changed. 1972 saw Nixon win the presidency nearly outright, with a new strategy used that iced out his opponent George McGovern as a radical liberal through wedge issues like abortion and marijuana legalization, while resting on the laurels of his first term's foreign policy successes. This election was the first time the Republicans had managed to carry the South, and looking at the president's rhetoric shows you how someone like Nixon would be able to do so by using both overt and subtle appeals to racial tension that made up the hearts and minds of political voters at the time in the South. It is time for an honest look at the problem of order in the United States. Dissent is a necessary ingredient of change. But in a system of government that provides for peaceful change, there is no cause that justifies resort to violence. Let us recognize that the first civil right of every American is to be free from domestic violence. So I pledge to you, we shall have order in the United States. Government can pass laws but respect for law can come only from people who take the law into their hearts and their minds and not into their hands. Government, <laughs> Government can provide opportunity, but opportunity means nothing unless people are prepared to seize it. A president can ask for reconciliation in the racial conflict that divides Americans, but reconciliation comes only from the hearts of people. Nixon would then become the template for every Republican to follow, run on these appeals alongside tax cuts wedge issues in the interest of rural conservatives to garner a win in the Electoral College. With the exception of Jimmy Carter's victory in the South after the Republican wreckage of Watergate, this strategy has successfully brought the majority of white voters, especially Southern ones, to vote red in every election since 1972, a strategy which has been dubbed the Southern Strategy. And yet, despite the fact that we can clearly map the changing Republican voting base to the changing Republican strategy and rhetoric, the question of how and why this transition began and succeeded remains unexplained. And perhaps more interestingly, why Republicans of every walk outwardly appear to struggle between the easy pickings of racialized politics and broadening their coalition to include minority voters, when inwardly that doesn't appear to be a struggle at all. For example, return your attention to the 1968 election and the internal conflict on race that occurred within that year's Republican primary. George Romney, undeterred by his loss to Barry Goldwater in the previous election cycle, brought his same vision of moderacy and civil rights. However, Richard Nixon was quick to stomp Romney out of the primary, painting him as unpatriotic and tying him to the 1967 violence that occurred in the black neighborhood of Detroit using it to push a claim that it was the civil right of all Americans to be protected from domestic violence, a sentiment which was later echoed in his support for Spiro Agnew, a well-liked governor who was popular among Southerners for his frequent appeals to law and order. In other words, this primary demonstrated a will of party leaders and party candidates to invest in growing Republican support among Southern whites and to purposefully neglect making inroads with minorities or, as George Romney would put it, failing to prevent an abscess from forming by failing to make party leaders from the states that win elections for Republicans as least as important as the new leaders from the South. However, this did not have to be the case for every Republican candidate. For example, in the wake of Carter's victory in 1976, prominent black politicians like Jesse Jackson seemed to captivate the Republican Party, leading to prominent Republican figures flirting with the idea of making inroads to black voters as a swing demographic. However, in response to Jimmy Carter's voting expansion policy, a wing of the Republican Party began to decry Carter's steps towards majoritarianism as susceptible to fraud and disenfranchisement of the Republican base. 
These voters flocked behind Ronald Reagan, the long-rising star who had championed rhetoric of voter fraud and reducing government power over the states. Even more recent Republicans like George W. Bush, who advocated for compassionate conservatism, a form of Republican thought that openly courted Hispanic voters, worked far more to preserve and empower that same white voting bloc while aiming to neuter potential coalition insurgencies, like Bush Jr.'s administration's crusade for voter ID and election integrity. So, to use all of these similar stories to answer the questions of how and why, the way in which the transition to a white voting bloc occurred in the Republican Party was through the repeated dynamic of candidates and party leaders seeing opportunities to win election by cultivating an enthusiastic southern and rural base through racialized rhetoric. And the reason to do so was that power was easier to defend and expand without having to contend for ever-growing and changing Big Ten coalitions. This defense and expansion is easily carried out through rhetoric, no matter how subtle, that pokes at underlying racial tensions within the white community. This white community is the one that GOP leaders chose to encourage and excite so as to get the specific votes they needed to win. Which is what brings us to the Republican Party of today. It isn't exactly clear what the Trump campaign sought to achieve with its efforts in courting voters of color in 2020. On the one hand, the outward rhetoric of the president and his allies appear to welcome them with open arms. To young people out there of color, to young immigrants, this is a great state. The one thing I can say without any doubt, you can be an African American and go to the Senate. You just have to share the values of our state. To every African American out there, look at my record. I've been supporting historically black colleges and universities and I'm glad President Trump has made it a, a permanent fixture now. We don't have to beg every year for the money. I care about everybody. If you're a young African American, a, an immigrant, you can go anywhere in this state. You just need to be conservative, not liberal. family went from cotton to Congress in one lifetime. And that's why I believe the next American century can be better than the last. There are millions of families just like mine all across this nation, full of potential, seeking to live the American dream. And I'm here tonight to tell you that supporting the Republican ticket gives you the best chance of making that dream a reality. However, there is a distinct contrast to these ideas in the constant escalation of culture war that goes on in the Republicans' legislative actions and duties. It's never overt, but it's been one of the few constant through lines of the past four years that extreme liberal bias in institutions and extreme liberal bias in Democratic officials leads to an unfair persecution of conservatives. And the logical yet unspoken conclusion of that train of thought is that it leads to unfair persecution of white people. But in recent days, our nation has been gripped by professional anarchists, violent mobs, arsonists, looters, criminals, rioters, Antifa, and others. A number of state and local governments have failed to take necessary action to safeguard their residents. Innocent people have been savagely beaten, like the young man in Dallas, Texas, who was left dying on the street or the woman in upstate New York, viciously attacked by dangerous thugs. And one of the reasons you can say with confidence that you think Brown versus Board of Education super president is that you're not aware of any effort to go back to the good old days of segregation by a legislative body, is that correct? By viewing every issue through the lens of race, they want to impose a new segregation, and we must not allow that to happen. Critical race theory, the 1619 Project, and the crusade against American history is toxic propaganda, ideological poison that, if not removed, will dissolve. The civic bonds that tie us together will destroy our country. So, can the Republicans have their cake and eat it too? Looking at 2020, that might be the case. 
take a look at how Trump made large strides forward in cutting into the Democrats' lead among African Americans, as well as Latinos and Asian Americans. It would seem safe to say that Republicans recognize the need to broaden their coalition to survive in the future, and that, although minor, these specific improvements might be the direction they want to head in. However, the confounding factor of Donald Trump's unique populist appeal cannot be ignored. Attributing this success on both sides of the coin to the president's effectiveness with the base leaves the door open on what happens next. Will the president try to replicate Grover Cleveland's split two terms? The majority of Republicans seem to want that outcome. Perhaps the more interesting statistic, however, is that an even bigger majority of the party believes that he is the one most in tune with the Republican rank and file. In other words, the politician most able to combat the targeted persecution and culture wars that motivate this base of white conservatives to turn out. However, suppose 2024 turns out not to be Trump's year. Can another politician manage to replicate his charisma? Where will the Republican Party go without him? All precedent points to a certain dynamic occurring once again. Moderates like George Romney, or perhaps Tim Scott and Nikki Haley, will run in the primary on a platform of building a big tent Republican Party, while hard conservatives like Richard Nixon, or perhaps Ted Cruz and Mike Pence, will rely on support from conservatives in the southern and rural base. Maybe a newcomer like Ronald Reagan, or perhaps Josh Hawley and Ben Sass, will bring a brand of revitalized ideology to sweep in and agitate the party. The most likely of those strategies to deviate from the party's nearly exclusive white conservative reliance seems to be the least likely to win, both in the eyes of historical precedent and primary voters. In other words, it seems likely that the choice to remain the party for white conservatives will continue to be highly appealing to the Republican Party. Looking at these inner party workings, one can see an almost cyclical nature of change that transformed the base, leaders, campaigns, and presidencies of the Republican Party. Beginning in the primary, party leaders and prospective candidates explore the idea of a presidential campaign that invites a broad variety of groups to bring forward a winning coalition. However, other perspectives instead opt for strongly worded appeals to the party's base and targeted attacks on those moderates as not being good enough for that base leading to a general election campaign that relies on a narrative of perceived mistreatment towards the specific demographics that Republicans need to cultivate and protect power. This has been the playbook for every successful Republican since Nixon, while a playbook that tries to compete with Democrats on majoritarianism has not been as reliable. Furthermore, this playbook has used race as the intrinsic, deep-rooted tool to motivate the chosen base and to found the claims of mistreatment. Racialized rhetoric's effectiveness, then, can be attributed as the primary cause for the party's transition from Lincoln to today.